Okay, no worries. Uh, Raj, we're just having a quick intro from Raj. He's one of yeah. our alumni. Just talk it and then we'll come on to you. So get, stay there for one second and then we'll be with you. Okay, so did journalism degree, then got a job in uh, publishing courtesy with the help of Creative Access. And then I was in that job for a couple of years and, you know, really wanted to get back into journalism because that was kind of where my heart li uh, lay, lied. Clearly, I'm really good at journalism uh, <laughs> and <laughs> can't speak. And then I got a job. Uh, I got onto the BBC uh, trainee scheme in 2015. So it took kind of four years from graduating to actually getting a, a proper journalism job and a bit of diversion in the middle. I uh, got into the trainee scheme and that kind of opened up a whole world of possibilities after that scheme ended I ended up as a political reporter BBC Radio Kent which was amazing incredibly hard you do everything yourself local radio is the best place to learn I think or local newspapers and I'm currently in my new well it's not even that new anymore I'm in a role which is BBC Scotland which is um, as a Westminster correspondent for a new TV channel that they launched in Scotland for a brilliant program which is called The Nine and if you're not in Scotland, you probably never watched it. But the way we describe it is kind of Channel 4 meets Newsnight or Victoria Derbyshire. If you watch those news programmes, it's, you know, an hour long, very chatty. We have guests on, you know, if you're in Scotland, watch it. It's a great programme and I'm on it. So, you know. Brilliant. Cool. Well, thank you. Robin. As I said, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm going to pass over to Ade and to you. And Ade, thank you for joining us. Raj is going to... Um, take the floor and ask you lots of questions. I believe we've got a carte blanche to ask you whatever we want. So, uh, <laughs> but you and feel if we did not we do now. now. Don't want. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna come off camera and either if you can hear us, can you mute your camera as well? Cause you're, um, and great. And uh, we'll, we'll leave it over to you guys. Brilliant. So as I feel like you don't really need an introduction because, well, I feel like everybody knows you, but I don't know if you want to say a few words cause you've had, I feel like you've had three careers, would that be right? Or you're in the middle of having two different careers? Uh, three careers. Um, okay, so I started, I suppose the first career people recognise me for is as a, a Paralympic athlete. Uh, competed at two Paralympic Games, um, captain GB in the 2002 World Championships to a silver medal, um, won a bronze at the Athens Paralympics and a gold at the Paralympic World Cup and uh, silver at the European uh, Championships. So that was my basketball career, um, TV career as well. So I've, I've present, I started off in children's TV, uh, presenting on uh, a show called, on Channel 5 called Tiger Tiger, uh, where I made, uh, I traveled around the world um, making uh, films about endangered animals. Um, then I went on to do more kids shows. I did a kids show called Exchange. So anyone in their 20s, might um might uh, probably remember the kids show called Exchange. I think I, I would say it was a cooler version of Blue Peter. Um, we 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 had um, or as someone said to me the other day, um, they said to me, "Oh, you used to be on that show called Exchange," and I said, "Yeah," and then they said, "Yeah, that was like the black version of Blue Peter." <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it's because we were the first um, kids show to have so solid crew. On, right. on the show live um, as well. And then uh, I presented the Paralympic Games with Claire Baldin on Channel 4. Uh, now I've moved into documentary making. So I make, uh, uh, well, I used to make documentaries for Unreported World, um, Dispatches. I've just done, I did two years ago, I did a series called Africa with Adia Depitan. I'm working on a climate change series, which was cut short because of the corona uh, virus and the fact that uh, we're not allowed um, into America or China at mm -hmm. the moment. So hopefully I'll, I'll get to finish that once the flight rail or travel restrictions are ended. And um, I've written three books, three children's books. So I'm, I'm a children's book author now as well. Does it sound crazy to list it all like that? Because just listening to it, it just sounds like such an incredible career that you've had? <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, it makes it, you're making it sound like it's, 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 I'm on the, on the, um, coming towards the end or it's all over. Oh, no, sorry, uh, sorry. The career no, that no, you're sorry. still going to have. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what? It's, it seems like a lot of stuff, but I yeah. think, 
I think what people have got to get their heads around, and, and it's not something that I set out to do, but the idea of being a one career person um, is, it, it, it's over. I mean, the days of people having a job for life has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think on average now, people have about six different careers um, in, in their lifetime. Yeah. And, and I, in one respect, for some people, it, it may seem to bring uncertainty because you're, you're constantly changing jobs. But in another respect, I look at it as quite exciting because it means you have an opportunity to try so many different things throughout your lifetime. Yeah. I would be bored if I just had one job. Um, if, if, if all I did for, for the next 40 years was the same thing, it would probably drive me crazy. So yeah, I, I, I love changing and going from, from, from job to job. And yeah, and, and I don't really, um, I don't often take time to look back and think, oh, look, look what I've done, look what I've achieved. I, I try to stay very much in the moment. So mm. in answer to your question, yes, it is probably a lot, but um, I've never really thought about it. <laughs> Just keep going. Um, I think what a lot of people are quite interested in and a lot of the questions which we've had are about how you made that tr transition after you know, that incredible sports career that you had and winning all those Olympic medals into the television side and the presenting side because now you've done so many, so many really cool documentaries and you've managed to make it seem like it was quite seamless. Was it seamless at the time or what were the challenges that you faced? Was it quite difficult to get in? Um, it definitely wasn't seamless uh, and it, 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 uh, TV wasn't, it wasn't something that was on my radar. It wasn't a, a career that I'd even thought about and I didn't even think it was possible. Um, I, I've said this a lot, but when I was growing up, I never saw anyone like myself on TV. Mm. I didn't see, I didn't see very many black people on TV and I didn't see um, any or any disabled people and I mean the only disabled people are, you would see would usually be um, you know playing roles or doing stuff that I yeah. was not interested in doing at all I was lucky that um, uh, I, I met uh, well <laughs> a, a friend of mine who was working at Kensington Council uh, he got contacted by a group of guys who uh, had who worked for a cable channel um, which would probably be the equivalent today of like Netflix or I mean much far far smaller but it was an independent um, broadcaster and uh, they wanted to make a film about uh, a wheelchair basketball athlete they wanted to make a film um, and they it was part of their extreme sports series um, they wanted to use someone who who was playing in the Great Britain squad. And my friend had told them about me. At the time, I wasn't playing for Great Britain. At the time, I was on the periphery and I was just trying to make it into the squad. Um, but I, So I said to him, I, I can't do it because I'm not in the squad. And he said, look, most people don't have a clue about wheelchair basketball or Paralympic sports, you know, just, just tell them you're in the team. And I was like, nah, no, nah, I can't do that. They'll find out. And then he said to me, um, cause I was broke at the time. I wasn't they earning that. They would, they would find out. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, but this was back in the nineties. So there wasn't that much access, you know, there wasn't right. like the internet to, to, to do your research and stuff on people. So I, so, so I, 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 I was saying to my friend initially, no, then he said to me, they're offering 250 quid for it. And I was broke at the time. And I said to him, ah, oh, tell him I'm GB captain. Um, because, <laughs> cause I was thinking, I want, I want this 250 quid. So they ended up coming around to film me. We spent a day filming. They really liked working with me. They said I came across really well on camera. Um, and they said that they felt I should do more TV and we stayed in contact. Um, and these guys were really cool and they had opportunities for stuff on channel five and, and other um, uh, avenues. And, and yeah, I took them. I mean, I, I, I sort of, it wasn't something that I said, yes, this is what I was going to do. But after I got my first job and I enjoyed it so much, I sort of made, started to realize in my mind, actually, I need to think of something to, that I, I'm going to do after I finish playing yeah. basketball. 
Um, and this opportunity, these opportunities like this, they don't come around often. So, you know, I, I should take it. So I really went for it. And um, I mean, it took 15 years, 15, 20 years, but here I am today. Yeah. And it's interesting because the first thing you got approached to do was, you know, wheelchair basketball. How did you break out of just doing things that were sport related into just becoming just a presenter for the BBC that has nothing to do with the colour of your skin or your disability? Um, so it's, it's funny you should say that because, you know, I, I, I did um, a basketball film for these guys. They, they had a production company called Two Hands Productions and I did a basketball film for their cable channel called Channel One. But that was the only thing I did that was basketball related. We made mm -hmm. a, a, a film called Hoop Dreams and it was our version of the American a famous documentary called called Hoop Dreams and it did well I mean you might be able to find it on YouTube if you google my name and google you, um, Hoop Dreams and you'll see a very young looking me but after that I didn't do any sport um, stuff after that I did you know my, my, my very first TV job proper TV job was um, a, a series about endangered animals called Tiger Tiger and the first piece to camera that I did was I was in India outside a, a uh, wildlife park um, and my director said to me um, you're about to go in and trek tigers wild tigers on elephant back present and I was like wow and and I mean talk about taking me completely out of my comfort yeah. zone I knew nothing about animals but I had to learn on the game and then after that, I started doing kids TV, which had, which, I mean, although there was a sport element to, to it, um, we talked about sports stuff. My, my main thing was interviewing pop, pop stars, um, making cakes, uh, gunging, gu getting gunged by kids, um, putting on fancy dress, um, playing games like Name That Poo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I did a variety of stuff and then I did a lot of travel stuff and my first proper serious um, sports TV stuff that I did was the Paralympics in 2012. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think we made a conscious effort at the beginning of my career to steer away from sports and, and, and I was really lucky that in my agent and the people who I worked with um, got me I, I was lucky to meet a few people who got me and understood that there was I had more to offer than just sport yeah so do you feel like because lots of people ask for advice and like one of the bits of advice that's really stayed with me is that you almost need like a, a cheerleader team behind you <laughs> it's not just about just you and always being resilient which is obviously really key and crucial because there's a lot of rejection out there in the media landscape but also that you need a team of really good people who understand you and when you're on your down days they can kind of lift you up and be like no nope, you need to keep going so is that what's I mean has that helped you throughout your career yeah yeah I, you're, you're, you're so right um you need what I call enablers you know enablers people who believe in you and and sometimes believe in you more than you believe in yourself. Um, and, and I found those people along the way. I, and I was very, very lucky because, you know, TV is not a, the, the TV business or industry is a really difficult industry to get into. Um, and I think the chances of me getting into that industry coming from my background um, and, and to get to where I've got to today uh, we're, we're really slim and if it wasn't for you know Luke and Jonathan at Two Hands Productions my agent John Knoll and his son Nick Nick Lennon and, and Polly Hill at my agency who for some reason saw something in me saw something that I, I didn't even see myself you know I, when I was making Tiger Tiger the series Tiger Tiger um, I think we were on our last film I was in Australia um, filming in um, in, uh, in in Cape Tribulation um, in, in the rainforest there, one of the oldest rainforests in the world. Doing pieces to camera. Um, this I I'd, I I'd, I'd been working in TV for about three months now, so I was starting to get a rhythm on this documentary series. And the director that I was working with at the time, a guy called Rob Sullivan, he said to me, "You sh have you thought of taking up this career seriously and doing TV seriously?" 
And I was like, at the time, I was like, nah, you know, the Paralympics are coming up next year. I'm going to focus on that. And also a friend of mine, when I told a friend of mine, I said to her, uh, I'm thinking of trying out TV. And she said to me, people like us don't get on TV. Listen to the way you sound, you know, people on TV, they've got posh accents or posh voices, you know, yeah, they don't have that, our sort of people. So that really dented my confidence. But Rob said to me, you need to get an agent. And I was, wasn't that interested. And he said, I've got a friend who's just breaking into the TV industry and mm -hmm. he's got a great agent and you, you should meet him. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And he said, well, my mate, is, his name's um, Dermot O'Leary. And what? Derm Dermot O'Leary was doing um, uh, T4, which was yeah, uh, I remember. a mag magazine show on Channel 4. He was supposed to do Tiger, Tiger, um, but he, he couldn't because of um, different commitments. So I got that gig. Um, but um, Rob introduced me to Dermot and I met Dermot in a pub in West London. Dermot had a good chat with me, he told me about his agent, told me how good his agent was and said I'd really get on with me, get on with him. He gave me his agent's number um, and said you should call him. And when I went home, I tore that number up and threw it away um, because I thought, I just felt too embarrassed to, to, to call his agent because I just thought, you know, I wouldn't fit in that industry. But four months later, after the series Tiger Tiger had aired on TV, um, mm -hmm. Dermot's agent just so happened to see me in that series. And he had put out a search for me. You know, he'd asked people, you know, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And Dermot went in and told him about me and said, you should sign him. And, 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 and my agent said, I've been looking for him. I'd seen him on TV. And so they got my number, called me, um, Hello, you still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're so still he there. got we're my number. He called me, and, and yeah, cool. He called me, and I, I, I went into the agency. Um, first of all, reluctant, just thought, uh, you know, this isn't going to work. And um, John, my agent, said to me, you know, I, I saw you on TV. I think you've got really, you've got something. And he said, I want to represent you, not because you're black, not because you have a disability, but because you're a bloody good presenter. And I was shocked. I'd never heard someone say that to me yeah. and, and be so positive. And he said, you know, we're going to create a plan for you, you know, and he said, you know, it might take five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, even longer, but we have a plan for you and we will get you to where you want to be um, in that time if you, if you have faith with us. And yeah, that, that when you talk about cheerleaders and enablers and a team behind me, I, I've been so lucky to have such an amazing group of people who yeah. have supported. So as we're talking about enablers, I think a lot of people might be wondering, how do I get myself somebody like your agent who is in the industry, believes in me and can give me that big break and, and that leg up? So how do we, it's, it's a conversation I've been having a lot with friends actually, how do we get more enablers into the industry that can bring in people who aren't the norm, who, you know, people who creative access help support, people who aren't white, people who don't talk the Queen's English, you know, people from all over the country. How do we do that? <laughs> Any ideas? Yeah, I mean, I think the great thing about today is um, you no longer have to rely on TV as the only way to get mm -hmm. into, into the media in, industry. You know, you can make your own stuff. Um, you know, there's so many people who are making things on Instagram, Instagram live streams, on, on Facebook live streams, on TikTok, um, all of those platforms on YouTube, you know, YouTube channels. You're getting people on YouTube channels who are getting five, six, seven million subscribers. And yeah. what you've got to remember is, or, 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 or see, is that actually, I think, the landscape of TV, the landscape of media is changing. You know, print media is really struggling. So um, their, their, their numbers are going down. Um, terrestrial TV numbers are going down. And I think over the next 10 years, we're going to see a shift. And it's going to go from where we're at now, where we, it's probably 95% people watch or consume 95% of their media via terrestrial um, channels to it being 50-50, you know, 50% um, terrestrial and 50% online. So what I would say is 
make your own stuff. Make your own stuff and put yourself out there. It's the best way to learn, make your own show reels, uh, go out there, film stuff, you know, um, come up with ideas, um, do live streams, interview people. And then when you've got that, you can put that, you can send that out to agents if you want to, or you can take control of your own stuff. You know, make mm -hmm. your own YouTube channel, um, make your own live stream, build your own audience um, uh, and, and have control of your own stuff because it, the landscape is changing. It is changing. And there's, I mean, you've got to remember as well with TV, there are only a few slots on TV. Yeah. And I'm not saying you shouldn't go for that. I think you should absolutely go. To, if, if you want to work on TV, if you want to um, be a journalist, go for that. But I also think, don't forget there are other avenues for you to express yourself and show your talents. Yes. Um, so we have a question that somebody submitted, uh, Ada, and she talks, well, she's asking how should people go about getting experience during the pandemic? What could we do during the lockdown that would enhance our employability skills within the news, journalism, TV industry? It's exactly what I said. Um, yeah. make, make live streams. Make li I, I've been um, doing live streams ever since the um, lockdown began. Um, I, I did a cyborg cat live stream, which was all about my children's book, where I was um, each week I was reading a chapter from my children's book and then interacting with the people who were coming on my live stream. I was getting guests on, doing interviews with guests. And that way I was constantly honing my skills. I was honing my interview skills. I was honing my presenting skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was honing my linking skills, you know? Uh, and, and, and I think these opportunities are so much more readily available than they were when I was um, young, you know, trying to get in the industry. They're amazing tools. The things you can do with your, with your phones. So not only was I um, doing these live, live streams and interviewing, a variety of people, you know, I, I, I interviewed from uh, it, illustrators or book authors to, um, to uh, an opera singer, a black female opera singer, um, to, to, to musicians. And that just gave me that opportunity to constantly be thinking, I'm even now I'm doing a mindfulness live stream. Um, so wow. I, I was caught, I'm caught, uh, on Mondays and then on Fridays I do a fitness Friday live stream. So I'm constantly challenging myself to think. And when, when, when I was doing those live streams, I would prepare the day before thinking of questions, thinking of how I'd make it interesting, thinking of how I would bring in people who are coming into my live stream, who are asking questions, finding out about their lives, getting those people on live. I was hosting competitions. So yeah, and then after that, I was then editing everything. I was getting editing apps and then editing it all and creating formats as I was editing it and putting it on my Insta stories. So there's so many ways for you to hone your skills where you don't need to be involved with like the mainstream channels. Yeah, I think there's definitely a push um, over the last few years to get people doing everything. So you're tweeting, you're editing, you're shooting, you're doing everything yourself. You're like a one man band. So you have all those skills and you could almost go work in, in any part of the TV journalism industry, but that's also quite a lot of pressure to put on someone to do everything themselves. Um, another question, which kind of ties into what you've been saying, um, Lydia Law says, how would you suggest I approach getting into the sports side of the TV industry as a disabled person once I finish my film and television degree next year? Mm. That is a good question. Um, I mean, I, I suppose sport is still dominated by um, uh, the, the, the mainstream TV uh, media because sport, is, the, 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 the difficulty about sport is it's expensive. It's, a, it's expensive, so only big um, companies at the moment can really afford to have the rights, you know, to show the football, the Paralympics, the Olympics. I would send in your CV um, uh, to Sky Sports, to um, BBC, to all of the normal um, channels. I, and I think right now they're crying out for diversity. I think at the, um, you, you know, they've had the same old, same old um, TV presenters and people who have been covering sports 
um, from the same angle on all of those channels. And they know that if they are to appeal to the next generation, they need to have younger people in there. They need to have younger people in there who are more connected with what's going on and with the with the sports of today. So I, I think there's definitely an opportunity for you to do that. But I also think you can go down to your local sports event and film some stuff with, on your own. You know, go go to uh, um, uh, a, a non-league football match or, you know, a, a wheelchair basketball game or rugby game. There's sports events, especially once the pandemic is over, there are sports events happening all the time, every weekend, mm -hmm. locally. Yeah. Go there and film, film something. Do you know, Lydia, I would also say, look up your local BBC radio station because I think there's about 40 across England. Um, and they are always on the lookout for sports stories because they mm. usually don't have loads of resources and that might be a way to get an in and get some experience or even maybe try and get a, a shadowing day there if you can once everything yeah. clears up COVID wise. Um, yeah, that's a really good idea because I, I, I always neglect to think about radio actually. Yeah, no, so do you know, much, yeah. radio is almost where I started my career and every time I go back to it, I love it and it's so underrated. And even with radio, you can use those skills in podcasting and it's actually a really great way. It's a great way just to practice speaking articulately and then moving those skills over to television because television can be really daunting because you also have to think about what you look like, not making a stupid face if someone asks you a question where you're like what I don't know the answer to that whereas on radio it doesn't matter what you look like you can just you just have to keep the panic out of your voice and you're good to go don't worry um, don't worry you it, stupid faces never stop me from getting anywhere <laughs> um so Laura Turner Blake has asked what advice would you give to your younger self around the self-doubt that you described mm. um I would think it, that is a good question. Mm. Um, I, I, I would think, I would say focus on your strengths because self-doubt comes from you worrying about things that you can't control. Um, self-doubt uh, comes from you worrying about what other people think of you, you know, and worrying about, um, you know, uh, uh, things that haven't happened, you know, maybe mistakes that you might make or things that you're not capable of. Um, I, I would just say to myself, focus on your strengths. Um, but then that my other my other question to myself then would be, you know, you have to find your strengths. Um, and to find your strengths, I would say, and it was something that I was quite good at um, naturally. I didn't know it at the time, but what I could, what I was able to do, is just throw yourself into every every um, situation and opportunity. Don't worry about making mistakes you know, challenge yourself, put, find your edges, do things that you, that might be a little bit out of your comfort zone. You know, I was always worried about um, doing live TV, uh, but I, 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 I just pushed myself into doing it. Yeah, you know, I was worried about um, interviewing and I just mm -hmm. pushed myself into doing it. Um, just don't be afraid or, or go for everything. And don't not do something because you're worried about making mistakes. That's what I would have said to myself. And that's what I'd say to yeah. anyone out there. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. I think the best things that I've got out of my career are when I have been so scared, but I said yes anyway, just because you're just trying to push yourself and get to that next, that next stage and that next level. And those are the ones where I've listened back or watched it back and been like, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I can do it. And once you show yourself, you can do it. I feel like you just build up those little steps towards all of that confidence the most, that you then have. The most, the most nerve wracking moment of my life. And it was something that I'd been worried about all of my career was um, that big live TV moment. And it yeah. was when uh, Claire Baldin and myself uh, opened the main show for the Paralympics for channel four. Um, we, uh, the, the, the whole, day had gone well the early morning sessions had gone well the opening of the Paralympics had gone well and we were opening to do the first evening session where the main events the sprinters the our, our gold medalists um yeah. potential um athletes were, were, were gonna um start and it was going to be my first time you know there was about five six million people watching um and you you have your earpiece in and you've done all your prep 
as much prep as you can and then you hear them doing the countdown and they start counting down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and then and it goes 5, and your heart's four, going. 4, 3, 2, 1, and you're live, and you're live, and your heart is going, and you're like, please be able to speak, please, please, can words come out of my mouth, um, and they did, you know, and as soon as I, I'd made my first joke, or I did my first, we, we, we'd made our, our first link, you know, things, things went well, but um, up until then, I was so, so nervous, and I think, you know, you just got to, just got to go through it, got to go through it, nerves are good, no, having nerves is a privilege, because it means, you, it means something to you. Do you still get nerves now? Yeah, all the time, all the time. I get nerves about everything, but I, I, I don't see nerves as, as a bad thing. I mm. see nerves as something that makes me, gives me heightened awareness. Um, it, me it means that I'm, I'm focused. It means that I, what I'm doing is, is, is important. You know, I, I get nervous going to a, a basketball training session and I've been playing basketball for 30 years. Yeah, um, but I, I, I love it. And I, I, I think it's, actually there's a real fine line between nerves and excitement and i and yeah. i i'm in between those and i think what you've got to say to yourself is turn it around and don't look look at nerves as your enemy use them don't be overwhelmed by them use the nerves and use use the energy and the power they give you um, so somebody else has asked, uh, how did you start your author career? Did you have a degree for it? Because obviously you've got, you're now a children's author as well. I've got three books, right? Yeah, three books. Um, wow. <laughs> I, I, on the education side of stuff, I was, uh, I came out of, um, I came out of school with, I don't know, I think it was about five GCSEs, um, <laughs> only three, only three of them. Um, above C grade, I left school early. I left. I, I did my A levels. I I did all right in the mock exams for the A levels. I got A's in my mock exams for the A levels, but I didn't actually sit the A levels because I was going through all sorts of drama in my life. Um, so I, I I didn't end up finishing them. Um, so and I didn't go to university either. Um, and I I don't know. University is one route, uh, and mm -hmm. and there are times where I miss. I, I, I wish I had gone to university because of the experience of university. But I, I, I think for me, it was just more um, about learning from life, my everyday experiences. And also knowing that just because I didn't have a degree didn't mean I wasn't intelligent. And I didn't have, I, 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 was, I still had the ability to learn. In terms of writing my book, I wanted to write an autobiography um, and mainly because um, I'd done so much in my life, like you mentioned earlier, and I was, I was starting to forget things. You know, I was having friends saying to me, do you remember when you did this, when you climbed that volcano, when you did that? And I was like, bloody hell, I, I, I've done all of these blooming things. Yeah. You know, maybe I should write them. And friends of mine were saying, maybe you should write them down. Maybe you should put them into a book. And so the initial idea was to write an autobiography about my life. And um, when we put that out to publishers, the publisher that came back to me, they, they said to me, you know, we, we, we like the idea. You, we're not, we like what you've written because I sent them a chapter. But they said, um, you know, the autobiography or the the, the yeah, that the biog world has become really competitive, and the only people who are really selling books are are, are Wayne Rooney and um, and and you know real uh, people who are coming out of um, reality TV shows. Mm -hmm. They're the only people who are selling those those sort of books. So, but they said what what's really important is at the moment there's a real big gap in diverse children's um, book authors, and yeah. also. Um, they're, they're, they're not, uh, there's a real um, problem with getting young boys to read yeah. and they said you know we really think that you could translate your story into a book that could get young kids and young boys and, and bring a diverse audience into it and initially I was a little bit daunted because you know I, I'd never ever thought about writing a children's book and I think writing a children's book is a real big responsibility um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, I wrote um, a, a couple of chapters. Uh, I started working with a guy called Ivor Badil and we started writing together. And um, 
you know, we, we, we put together the ideas of the cyborg cat and it was, and, and yeah, after we wrote the first book, I think I just got the bug. I got the bug and I, and, and, and I just, yeah, I loved it, loved it. Because the character is based on, on you, isn't it, and, and your life. The character's called Addy, isn't he? might be based on me might be based on someone who looks like me or sounds maybe, like maybe but there are a lot of similarities <laughs> why, yeah, why because, did why did you choose that um i think i think sometimes it's important to write about what you know mm -hmm. um and yeah i i i i knew about what it was like to 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 have a disability to be uh, to be different to be one of the few black kids in in my school and um and 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 also i knew about the importance of friendship and how much friendship had helped me growing up and and i just felt these are things that would resonate with young children and yeah i had i i, I think i've got quite a good sense of humor and uh, me and i have a throw jokes back and forth to each other when we're doing our writing process um yeah. and and i thought you know you combine all of those together and you've got all the the, the qualities for a, for a good children's book and and i knew growing up there were many stories in my life that i had growing up that i thought would translate very well into into a kid's book um but they also you know you you have the creative license of an author to then go from the reality of a kid called Addy who's dreaming of being a superhero and from that you create the cyborg cat you know from that you create the Parsons Road gang and and from that you create the, the, the these villains and it's you know the good versus evil it's the the, the lesson um yeah, I, 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 I spoke to an, a, a journalist and she gave me this really good analogy about books and she said um the thing about books are there are window books and there are mirror books um window books give people an opportunity to see into the lives of other people mirror mm -hmm. books give uh, people an opportunity to ref have a reflection of their own lives and i felt there weren't enough books out there that gave people a window into the life of someone like me there were many kids out there like me who felt different who had either disabilities or um came from a different cultural background to their surroundings and their story wasn't being told you know mm -hmm. and if it was being told it wasn't being told in a positive way they weren't being shown that they could be superheroes yeah, yeah. And, and and one of the really important things about society is if you don't tell the if you don't give people a platform if you don't give people opportunities then it gives um it, it allows society or others in society to form negative views about those people so if you don't see disabled people and if all you do is sit when you see disabled people is see people talking about them being ill or getting benefits then that perpetuates this mindset in people that people with disabilities are um not intelligent are poor are are, are, are are not leaders you know and the same with people of of color you know so i i felt it was really important that these books had those messages within them but interwoven in in, in those messages we put a lot of fun in there yeah that actually brings us quite nicely on to uh, Anushka Dossa's question, which is, what are your thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement? And do you think things will change and progress? <laughs> oh, wow. If I, had, um, if, I, if I had a pound for every time someone's asked me that question over the last yeah. couple of weeks, I'd, I'd be a millionaire. Um, I mean, how, what, what's your, how are you feeling after all of the George Floyd stuff and the protests that we've seen in America here? Like, what's your emotional state at the moment? Because I feel like people have gone through many stages <laughs> since. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm feeling a lot better than I did perhaps two weeks ago. Yep. Um, you know, the week of, of George Floyd's murder, because um, that's what it was he was killed um uh i was that that really affected me it affected me so much so that it was probably a good week and a half 
before I was able to to actually watch it. Um, you know, to watch a full video, I just felt I I couldn't watch it. It was just so painful. And to do, compound do you feel like that, people it, did? Do you feel like you actually needed to watch the video though? Because I I have not watched the full video because I just I can't bring myself to it. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like there is so this isn't the first video we've had. You know, videos of black men being killed and suffocated and saying they can't breathe previously. So did you feel like you needed to see that video? At first I didn't. Yeah. At first, at first I didn't, but then I think, you know, if you remember that week, there was also the Amy Cooper incident mm -hmm. in yep. Central Park. And something in me told me that this is a really important moment, that this moment is different from others. Um, this is almost like the straw that's going to break the camel's back. You know, mm -hmm. th th this is the point where, you know, we, we all have to say enough is enough. And we stopped. I, I felt I stopped talking about just me being angry and other people of colour being angry. But I, I, I'd say I felt that this was time for a whole generation of people, white, black, of all cultural backgrounds to say enough is enough. You know, because the, the thing that we've all been, we, we've all been brainwashed into thinking and, and what we've fallen into is this false idea about race, that there are other races that, you know, there's the black race, there's the white race, you know, there's the Asian race. It, 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 there's only one race. We are all of the, of the same race. So when... George Floyd, when Amon Aubrey, when all of these uh, uh, um, these other kids who are being getting killed are, are getting killed, that's all our children. That's all of us that are suffering. So we have to make that. It ha the change has to happen. It has to happen now. It's it, 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 it's a scar on on all of us. Now my generation had a huge fight on our hands in terms of we had to deal with overt racism you know on the streets people would use the n-word or the p-word regularly on a regular basis when i was growing up um and the bmp the british national party the national front they were very prevalent and and there were certain areas that were dangerous i think that's changed i mean listen it's not gone all together you know we've seen uh Plenty of things. I, I think the guy who flew the aeroplane over the Burnley football Burnley. team, um, yeah, uh, yeah, that when uh, their, their their home match proves that people are still willing to do crazy stuff um, it, it, because of this false notion of of race and and, and racism. But um, I, I I think that generally that type of overt racism has has moved away, and now. This generation, your generation, because I'm because I know you're way younger than me, have a much tougher battle and much more complicated battle to deal with. And I mean, I will be there trying to fight it with you, but it's to deal with systemic racism. It's to deal with racism uh, that is within the institutions of society. You know, our education education system. What kids are getting taught. You know what they what they aren't getting taught are the legal um, system. You know the healthcare system, um, mm. the media, all of these systems that, uh, and and all of these institutions. Many of them were created a long, long, long time ago. You know, um, that, like the, the the legal system was created hundreds of years uh, ago, and you know they were created by people with racist views with uh, a point of view about people of color that was extremely negative. And we've inherited that system and it has to change. And, and I, I, I say to a lot of black, white people, because I know there are a lot of white people out there who are thinking, this is again, I'm not a racist yeah. and this black lives matter is, is, um, is threatening me. And I feel aggrieved because of everything they're saying when I'm a good person. Well, actually, what I'm saying is, no, it's, it, it, this isn't your fault. What happened in the past isn't your fault. But what will be your fault is if you don't make an effort to change it.
yeah. you know. So we can't change the past, but we can change what's happening now. Do you think um, change will happen now? And how do you think we can accelerate it? Because the change in the past has been, feels, I know a lot has changed in the last 50 years, but it still feels quite slow to know that we're in 2020 and this is still happening. Well, um, the ball's in our court. Yeah. You know, I think there are far more tools now um, in order to, to, to push change. You know, you, you, the, 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 there's social media where we can make our voices heard. Um, you know, so even the, 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 the a person from the most remote place can make their voice heard. But I, mm-hmm. think, um, I think the big thing is, is education. You know, people need, yeah. in, in, in order to dismantle a, a racist system or a system that, um, that has systemic racism woven into it, you need to understand how it was created. So not in that more, more of you, more of this, this younger generation, more of us have to go back in history and see why it was created. Why, why is it that certain people of color would treat, are treated differently to others? Um, and then when you understand that, then you can go about trying to dismantle it. I have one more very quick question. It's from yeah. Kemi and he asks, well, she asks, sorry, yeah. they ask, what is your experience as a black man in the media industry? Which I think will be a nice one to end on. Whoo, um, complicated. It was, it's been difficult. It has been difficult because I, I, I think from the beginning, there, there's always been preconceptions um, or, uh, and misconceptions of, you know, who I am, what I'm about, what I should present, whether I should be presenting stuff, um, whether anyone would watch what I'm on, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I, I felt I've had to fight. I've had, I had to fight for every job that I've got, every yeah. job. And it's only sort of like in the last five or six years that it's gotten easier. Um, I also had to um, initially fight to stay, uh, uh, to, to be myself. And, and this is something that's really important for people who are coming into TV. Uh, and this is not just uh, about your cultural background. This, this is also class. People who mm-hmm. are not the norms who we normally see in TV. You have to be, you have to fight for the right to be you. Don't try and modulate who you are to fit into TV and, to be, and, and try to be someone else. You have to be yourself. And, and that's what I, I had to fight with. I had to fight um, in terms of the scripts that I was given, you know, uh, how they wanted me to speak, what they wanted me to talk about, all of that stuff. Um, and and, and th- those were the real difficulties. So I would be, it's been 16 or 17 years of real hard graft um, to, to make an, an opening. Um, and then the last two or three years have been slightly easier. And I hope the graph that I've done, the work that I've done will make it easier for people like me, other people like me to come in because I've shown that it can be done. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Addy. That was fascinating. And hopefully a lot of people got a lot, of, a lot out of it. I know I, I definitely did. Um, so thank, thank you. you so much. Thank no, you. Thank you. So- so sorry I was late on, but yeah, thank you. Well, you're everyone. forgiven because you've given us so much amazing food for thought and you are really a truly inspirational role model. And I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, you have really, you are the true meaning of the word trailblazer because actually you have blazed a trail for others. And, you know, you've given real hope to people, you know, from, from real underrepresented communities that they can also have a voice. Um, and as you said, in the words of a basketball player, the ball is in our court now. Um, and I think that it's really incumbent on us and the industry to really rise to the challenge and, you know, uplift, bring in talent, uplift them to senior levels and really so that we can get, you know, true representation in the creative industries. So um, I'm going to... Can I just say, can I just say one, can I just say one thing, one really quick thing? Um, I think that the, the, in the industry and the leaders in the industry, it's all about your philosophy all about your philosophy. You have to have a philosophy 
which is about equality and which is about uplifting people. Otherwise, the changes you make will just be temporary. They'll be I just agree, yeah. for now. But if it's in the very skin of who you are, then, then you will always think in that way. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It's not a tick box exercise. It's actually about embedding it in absolutely everything you do. So it really is at the heart of your values. Um, yeah. okay, so just for everybody who's asked, we will be uploading the video and a write up to our YouTube channel later today, tomorrow morning, we'll be putting on our social media. Um, and for those of you that we haven't had a chance to answer questions, you can follow Raj and Ade on, Ade on uh, social media and um, that's yeah. probably the best way to get a hold of them. Thank you, yeah. thank you Raj, it's been amazing seeing you again, it's gorgeous. And thank you Ade, really, you've both been completely brilliant and we're really privileged oh. to have you both here. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> thank <laughs> you, thank you Raj, thank you Josie. Thank you Ade. Bye. 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 Bye.